please welcome to the stage, Eric Sprunk. Thank you. Eric, it's great to have you here, and you actually have quite a few ties. Oh, there we go. John, are you taking care of us over here? Is that what's going on? <laughs> Last presenter of the day. <laughs> so Eric, you actually have quite a few ties to the Seattle region, and we can get into those in, in just a bit. But I wanted to start with something that I think a lot of people followed at Nike, and that was the, the fuel band. And if I could, <laughs> uh, we could advance that slide there. Um, oh, you have slides. We, we do, in fact, oh, have a slide. So, a nice surprise there, So Todd. It, it might be tempting to say that this was Nike's first move into what we call wearables, but of course, Nike is all about wearables in a very literal sense, so that yeah. wouldn't be quite yeah. fair. You actually went into hardware, had a fitness tracker, the, the, the fuel band, and it, it got, ended up getting discontinued. So we wanted to start but just by talking about that, by getting a sense for why that decision was made, the lessons you learned through the launch of the hardware product, and, and where you are now in terms of this particular market. Can you catch us up to speed? That was it for the formalities, the kind of the nice to see you. What about, what about the field <laughs> hey, band? We played a commercial, didn't we? I see how this, I see how this works. Uh, actually, it's tempting to say that was the first four way, uh, foray into wearables or hardware, but a um, little known fact, we had, a, we had an agreement with Philips uh, many, many years ago to make uh, an MP3 player and actually enjoyed uh, the market leading position of the MP3 player for, uh, for a pretty good amount of time. And um, I don't know if anybody ever had one of those Nike MP3 players. You, oh, Frank, of yeah. course. Yep, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Super difficult to load music on it. It held about 11 songs, so if you were any type of a runner, you were cycling back through your playlist. Uh, but it taught us quite a bit about a really, really um, simple intuitive insight which was, uh, you know, we know runners really, really well. We spend a ton of time with runners. It's really the heritage and history of our company. And, uh, and we just noticed a lot of people were, were listening to music while they were running for inspiration, for motivation, for, uh, for longevity, et cetera. And so we wanted to tap into that. We, at the time, we worked with Philips. Um, and and that w we learned a lot from that. And then that was about the time that we started to partner up with our friends at Apple. And, um, we enjoy a really, really good relationship with Apple. Their, their CEO, Tim Cook, is, is on our board. Uh, I think most people know that. Our CEO, Mark Parker, and Tim are uh, friends in and out of the boardroom. And, uh, and we partnered with them to say, hey, we have, this, we have a good idea. We don't, we're not good at bringing this to life for our consumers. We don't believe it's a premium experience that matches the premium product that we, that we are gonna give to our consumers. Can you help us? Can you help us think about this music and running combination? That's where Nike Plus was, uh, was born. Um, and that was, if you remember that, there was a little chip in the shoe. You listened to uh, music on your iPod and it told you how far you were running, how fast you were running. You, could, you had a power song you could go to if, you were, if your energy was starting to to be zapped, and we were working that beat with, um, with Apple, and, uh, and it was a great learning. A couple of really good things that came out of that. One is we have a, a history uh, in our company of, of, I don't think arrogantly thinking we can do anything, but confidently thinking if we put our minds to it, we can do just about anything, and um, that makes us not so great partners sometimes, and the Apple we, we recognized if we were going to solve this problem for runners well, on this insight, we, we needed partners. We needed somebody other than the folks at Nike. So we went down to, went down to Apple. I, I've, I've told the story a few times. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time with Steve and, and Tony Fidel was their VP of engineering at the time to help us think about this. And, and that was kind of where that partnership was, was born. And it's, I, it shouldn't be any surprise that a, a, even the world's largest, and, and I, I, of course, think the best, uh, sports uh, apparel and footwear company had r really limited um, electrical engineering uh, expertise. It's just not. It's just not what we do. And uh, and that Apple relationship taught us how to work with partners, how to how to think differently about the services we were providing with our products for consumers. And we and and it was uh, it was a great success. Still is today. Nike Plus Running is still one of the best uh, apps out there for the fitness consumer. And what we realized is that that was, that, that was great and, and it hit the running community. But what we really wanted is, if you follow our, our mission statement, it is to provide inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And we put a little asterisk by the athlete and that asterisk says, if you have a body, you're an athlete. So frankly, we want, we want to provide inspiration and innovation to everybody to move, to be healthier, to get off the couch, et cetera. And that's where the fuel ban idea came from. And, 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 and lots, of, lots of technical 
um, solutions were being offered to the market. They were super expensive. They were really uh, difficult to use as a user. You had to sync stuff up. It was GPS oriented. And so we went back to Apple and said, you know what, we just want to motivate people to move. We want to, and you could, you know, at that time, you could get an accelerometer in your Happy Meal from McDonald's, and so it wasn't <laughs> life-changing, but we wanted to put it in a device that was simple to use. You know, we, we, uh, we use color, we use graphics, and, and kind of an object of beauty, and that began the, the field band, and Apple was a great partner in getting us into that space, and we got first mover advantage there as well. And then you realize, uh, especially at a company our size, you can't be everything to everybody. And I remember coming back from one of our visits, a uh, team of Nike folks, this was when I was running the product for the company, a team of Nike folks, we came back to uh, Nike, we had met with Apple on it, and um, I had asked Tony Fidel, so how, about how many electrical engineers do you guys have working down here? How many fo folks are working on, on, uh, on these components and stuff? And several hundred was the answer. And at Nike, we had less than the, the less than that. Let's say <laughs> a really small amount, right? You could count them on one hand, and uh, and that's where we said, you know what? This is this is a great space. Is it our role to be in the hardware space right. for this, or is it our role to be in the in the ecosystem and the content and and the experience part of it? And that's when we said, as a company, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna exit this part of it. It was great learning, great first mover advantage, but that's not where we see the future for our company, even though it's a bright future for many other companies. So what is Nike's future in technology? I mean, that really is, begs the question of where you're headed from here, because that is, that is so what when, most people want to know. So, yeah. when you say tech, so when we say technology, I mean, literally, Nike, uh, Nike technology pervades everything we do. So this type of, if you talk about wearables as a, as a, a narrow view of technology, you know, we, we, want, we want the ecosystem. We want, you know, we want to provide guidance and content and, and inspiration and celebration for you, irrespective of what activity you're doing, irrespective of what device you're wearing, whether it's the, you know, we're, Nike Plus running is on iOS, it's on Android, it's on the Apple Watch. We do a lot of stuff with Garmin now, we do TomTom. -Tom. It's, a, it's a pretty wide open uh, ecosystem for us. We, we want to be the people that help you become a better athlete, uh, which may mean help you go on your first run. It may mean run your first uh, marathon with training. We want you to have access to, to LeBron James uh, uh, drills. We want to have, you know, to have access to our coaches and, and to all of the people that use our products. That, that, that's, our, that's our role. And however you choose to, to receive that on whatever device, there's tons of great companies doing really great work there. We want to own that ecosystem. We want, we want, to, we want to be that, uh, that, the master of that content for our consumers. That's interesting that you talk about the ecosystem and the data and the wearable tracking that comes from these devices. A couple of your competitors, Under Armour, they've spent $700 million buying these apps that track the data and tell you information from that data. Adidas also. Can we expect Nike to do something there? And how does Nike fit into that software side and the ecosystem of, of all that fitness data that comes from the trackers that you're talking about? Yeah, you can, um, I, th I think, Taylor, you were at, can we expect you to be in the, the acquisition mode? So I'm not going to answer that question. We don't ever say ne we don't ever say uh, never. But should you expect us in this space? Without a doubt, continuing to build experiences for our consumers, whether that that is app based, a Nike app based, or it's part of that ecosystem. Without a doubt, you know the fuel band was was really really uh, successful for us because it's a very simple measurement. This Nike fuel, how much did you move today? But we have a Nike Training Club app. I don't know how many people use the Nike Training Club app. It's a great app uh, to help you train better. Uh, and Nike Running is, is uh, one of the best apps out there. So you should expect more from us, richer, deeper content, and more and more data analytics. Again, in the, in the spirit of we want to help you be better. We want to help you achieve more. We want to help you be more healthy and be an inspiration for you to move. And if you want to run a marathon, you can train with, our, with, with the expertise of Nike. If you want to lift weights, you can train with the expertise of Nike. If you want to jump higher, if you want to, whatever uh, movement of sport or activity you want, we want to help you do that better, safer, uh, to a higher level. That's where you should expect us to play. So you've worked closely with Phil Knight. In fact, uh, in a speech to the University of Washington Foster School of Business, you described Phil Knight as your tutor in many ways as you were coming up yeah. through the company. 
What have you learned from him? He's, he's now oh, the, the outgoing chairman of Nike. What, yeah, uh, he was my boss for a while in the right. company. That's right. Uh, as I was kind of meandering my way from uh, a finance professional to a product person to the COO. And, uh, you know, Phil, we're blessed at, at our company. The, the, one of the co-founders is still active in our day-to-day -day business. We're, not, we're just not that old of a company. We just went over 30 billion uh, our last fiscal year. Our fiscal year end is March or May 31st. He, so you see, you still see Phil around. He's still very present to the employees. He's he's courageous and he takes risks and he's he's really ir, uh, I was going to say irrelevant, irreverent. Got <laughs> 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 to make make sure I use the right word there. Uh, he's just really irreverent, and that is the culture. That's the culture that he has embodied in the. In the company, and so we, you know, we have a very uh, collegial uh, uh, atmosphere on our campuses around the world. Uh, Phil was a member of Bill Bowerman's team at the University of Oregon, so he knows that every member of the team is important. So we have a lot of sports analogies. The most important of which is coach and team versus boss and employee, or even manager and subordinate, and. Uh, and so he, he keeps the culture of the company alive every day, but he is, he's taken some really bold, bold uh, chances. Most of them have paid off, not all of them. And, uh, and, and he, 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 he keeps us honest, even at 30 billion, to be a little irreverent, to, be, to, to, uh, to not take ourselves too seriously, to make sure that we're always asking, is that the best you can do? Is that your best effort? Uh, listen to the voice of the athlete. Make sure they're running the company, not the executives of the company. There's, there's things about Phil that resonate with all of us. You mentioned culture, and I think the culture at Nike is fascinating because you got a beautiful campus down in Beaverton, Oregon. There's running trails that the athlete, or the employees use. There's gyms, um, but I know that you guys also hire a lot of former athletes. And so, is the culture and the internal processes is it get really competitive because former athlete A wants to beat former athlete B or managers, like how, is it really competitive at Nike or is it more collaborative with the manager, the thing you were just talking about? We are, we're highly competitive, but we're highly competitive out. We're not highly competitive in. It's not a, um, it, 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 we have a matrix organization. So at pretty much every part of your career uh, journey, you're gonna have more than one boss. And so collaboration and communication are the key to get things done. And so you can't be competitive internally. It just it stymies the organization and we don't get work done. Uh, but we're hyper competitive outward. So all, we're, we're keenly aware of who the competition is, what they're doing. We focus, frankly, we focus more energy on where are we versus what we think our potential is versus where we are versus where the competition is. But we're, we're, we're competitive and we, we do hire a lot, of, a lot of athletes. You know, it's not like the place is crawling with high school and, and ex-college athletes, but but that's part of our culture. You know, we, we are blessed uh, to be able to tap into the power of sports, which is literally a global phenomenon. Nowhere is, nowhere is there no passion for sports anywhere in the world. It allows us to tap into that passion. And sometimes uh, when, you, when you are energized by sport personally, or you were a, 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 a participant at any level, it's easier to, it's easier to, to uh, tap into that. But we've got plenty of, we've got, we've got you know, thousands of non-athletes as well. So it, one of the unique positions that Nike is in is that your customers are professional athletes in addition to just everybody else, the general public, but you have very close relationships with many professional athletes. So who do you look at first when you're making a new product? Do you make it for the, the professional athlete, the amateur athlete, the everyday person? When you look at your customer base and you're targeting a product, how do you think about it? Because it seems like those segments could be very different in terms of their needs. Yeah, they are, they are really different. You know, it used to be, we designed for the extreme. There's no doubt about it. You take, if you're gonna design a basketball shoe, um, we're gonna design it for Kobe Bryant. And Kobe Bryant is, uh, he's pretty unusual in, in how well he knows his body, the physiology, how it works. But we're gonna, divide, we're gonna design to a solution for Kobe and then we're gonna learn from that and bring it to bear in the rest of our product line. And that used to be kind of a, that used to be the formula for a lot of companies, and it's frankly still the formula for a lot of our competitors. And what we found is that over time, what that, that leads to is, is design by subtraction, right? So you gotta, if, you, if the Kobe shoe is 200, you probably need a 125, you probably need a 75, you probably need a 50. And all, if all you're doing is subtracting from 200 to get down to 50, what you're left with at 50 isn't all that compelling. So we also go from the bottoms up. We, 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 what, what is, uh, what is the, the product that our core high school kid 
whose parents can't afford the Kobe Bryant at 200, but they can't afford 60, 65, 70. They're gonna play on the high school team. They're gonna run cross country. They just wanna get fit, They're, you know, for whatever reason. We, want, we have a specific team of people that work just at that because they put pressure up. Because if they make a fantastic $65 shoe, then the, then the people making the $85 shoe have to, have to up their game. And so we, we work at it both. But we start, we design with the, the voice of the athlete. And we're blessed. I mean, we, we, we get to work with the world's best athletes. We miss every, one every now and then, but the, and I know you're all thinking of a couple athletes, like, yeah, yeah, what about this person? We can't have everybody, but our, but our cadre of athletes is, is our best consumer. Literally, Phil, one of Phil's buzzwords is always, listen to the voice of the athlete, and that's what we try to do. What's the craziest thing that's ever happened on campus with one of your pro athletes? You can tell oh, us. Oh, jeez. There's athletes on campus all of the time, literally. At any given time during the NBA season, NBA athletes all, all the time. Uh, when John and I visited campus last month, there were parking spots for professional athletes, Derek Jeter, Oscar De La Hoya. I thought about parking in one of them, but I, I passed. <laughs> does it, so does that would, mean it, would it disappoint you to know that my parking spot is Gary Payton? <laughs> Gary bit, Payton, yeah, it, I don't want to disappoint you, but it's okay. I'm a blazer. All the, all the reserve spots are athletes' names, but... Um, uh, got it, got I, it. So I'm sorry to disappoint you, okay, okay. Taylor. I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's okay, Eric. Usually if there's an athlete on, uh, out there, you'll know because there's a banner that says, welcome, you know, oh. Ken Griffey Jr., I, I well, do welcome like the... LeBron. <laughs> and typically we will, we will provide access uh, for that athlete with the employees. The employees love it, super cool. Um, and nothing really outrageous happens on campus because we try to create that as a safe zone for them. We don't let the employees rush up and get autographs and take selfies and, and do all that. But we will, you know, LeBron will uh, have an all-employee, uh, you know, Q&A with, with uh, the folks from the basketball group. Or Derek Jeter, when he was going to retire, came out and, and, and hit balls in a batting cage and talked about stuff like that. But, so nothing really outrageous. But, if, but um, most all of us, I've had the opportunity to meet yeah, pretty, pretty much all my heroes. That's awesome. Yeah. It's great. I think the whole, app, the whole game of Nike, Adidas, Under Armour going after these different <laughs> athletes is kind of fascinating. Nike kind of pioneered that yep. with Michael Jordan. Um, and you mentioned Kobe. That's funny because Kobe used to be an Adidas guy and now he's with Nike. How do you guys go about picking which athlete to bring on the team? And then how, do you, like, how, how did the sponsorship deals get set up? Like how much do you say we're going to pay this guy this much because he's going to impact our company by X? How do you go about picking the athlete and doing that kind of stuff? Because it's with Under Armour, you mentioned they've got Jordan Spieth and Steph Curry, and they're signing all these guys, and they're kind of copying Nike. I knew that was going to come up. <laughs> you, couldn't help, you couldn't help yourself. I'm what sorry. are we, 10 minutes in? <laughs> 10 minutes in, like I said, Seth Curry, Jordan Spieth. Next, Russell Wilson, right? Probably. I thought that was coming next. Uh, yeah, you know, we have, a, we, have a, a, we have a function in the company called Sports Marketing, and their job is to scout and serve and sign the future athletes and the best athletes in the in the sports that we care about and and we pick the ones that seem to resonate the most with our uh with our consumers and and frankly the ones that we think you know the 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 secret sauce of sports marketing which phil invented uh before michael jordan actually steve prefontaine what we call if if bill bowerman and phil knight were the co-founders of the company steve prefontaine was the soul of the company and and phil gave steve things to run in uh, gave him Nike products to run in in hopes that people would see Steve as a great uh, American runner and want to buy the products that he was wearing. That was, and voila, sports marketing was born. And then, and then the Michael Jordan signing really took it over the top because it was really about a bunch of, it was monetary, right? Um, that, that, that strategy still works. And so we want it to be, we want it to be commercial. There's, there, I would, uh, you know, you could, Everybody thinks being a quarterback of an NFL team is an unbelievable achievement, and it is, frankly, an unbelievable human achievement. But I would ask anybody in the room to name uh, more than 12 starting quarterbacks in the NFL and more than four or five who you thought could actually sell shoes and represent the, ban the brand. Now, we, we want coverage uh, on as many players as play the game at the highest level, but so we'll look at things like uh, how well do they resonate with consumers, what's the commercial uh, viability, what is the risk, some come with more risk than others, and uh, and then and then I wish there was a, a, the accountant in me wishes there was a formula that said, based upon these five factors, we'll pay this amount. It's an art. It's an open market, so bidding's coming from other companies, and it's an art as to what you. It's a gut and an intuition as to what you think you should pay those. Soccer teams in Europe are the same thing. You know, making a ton of money. So you uh, are from Montana originally. I am. Yeah, you of course now live in Oregon. 
but you have several connections, many connections to Seattle. Can you talk a little bit about the regional differences that you see oh, and, yeah. and, and Nike and the relationship <laughs> to Seattle? At least I know you have a lot of strong feelings about Does this. Does it make you nervous that you have a Portlander up here at Not the, at least. At the hey, Geek Wire? Am I, Actually, is, is there, let me, am let I me the just, only Portlander no, up no, here no, today? No, no, no. Let me make clear. I am outnumbered on the stage in terms of Portlanders. I know. We've got two yes, right here. So, exactly. Right. I didn't see many other Portlanders up here, um, frankly. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I, I'm, I, I have five children. Uh, the two oldest ones, 28 and 27 now, are University of Washington graduates. I have a junior right now at the University of Washington. I have another junior uh, playing football for the University of Montana, and then I have a senior in high school. And so... And he's the uh, one who's going to go to Montana, right? No, the, 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 one, the other one did the, already. Yeah, right. Okay. The junior, there's a junior at Montana who's a redshirt sophomore, so yeah. Maggie is the youngest. I think she might end up being a Husky as well, so there'll be four Huskies, and I'm married to a Cougar, so... <laughs> the dynamic in the house gets a little... Um, uh, so I've been, so uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge, I have to admit, I'm a huge fan of the University of Washington. It, Blair, my wife, and I are on the parent board. I spend a ton of time with the foster school business because, frankly, I believe they turn out great students on the business side, and I want more of them working for our company. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, the, the Seattle perspective of Portland is, oh, the University of Oregon and Oregon State, of Portland State are feeding Nike, and I'm going to go to the University of Washington, and I'm probably going to go to work for Amazon or Microsoft or Starbucks or one of the tech startups that's represented out here, all, all unbelievable companies. And, I, and I, want, I want people to know, yeah, no, you have, we have an unbelievable $30 billion company in Portland, Oregon that does amazing things for, for our consumers and for the world. And we are, frankly, a lot of being a tech company. I want, I want people to know, hey, by the way, it's, it's, it's talent recruitment. And I also want uh, f folks to know that um, in, in Beaverton, Oregon, where we're headquartered, that the University, of, the University of Washington is an amazing school. So I do spend some time there. And, and that's because, frankly, my kids, my kids are up here quite a bit. I'm a huge Seahawks fan. And, uh, and we've had board members. We, Nike's had, you know, uh, board members from Starbucks. We've had John Connors is on our board right now from Microsoft. So there's been a, there's been a good Seattle-Portland connection, but it sometimes feels like, well, for sure, I, I, for sure I've been at GeekWire for one day. For sure I feel like, oh, Portland, huh, huh, <laughs> Portland. Do you, guys have, do you guys have any tech down there? Yeah. <laughs> at least one of our inventions we love was from Portland. Came yeah. on up, so, yep. Yep. yeah. So there, there's some good cross pollination. Taylor it's, actually, uh, Taylor does a great job of covering the Portland tech scene. You do. Even you've written a couple stories about us. That's yeah, right. Right. Even. Yeah. I, I got asked. I have to share the story at dinner last night. I mean, I was not overly snazzily dressed, but I had a nice looking sports jacket on, if I do say so myself. Jeans and and some shoes. And we at the end of the at the end of the dinner, I was talking to a bunch of people I'd met last night here at the Geek Wire dinner. And one person who I, who I won't know, name goes, you know, you don't look like you're from Portland. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, do you mean? I, what do you mean? They don't look like you were from Portland. I was, I'm not wearing socks with my Birkenstock sandals <laughs> and my University of Oregon t-shirt and stuff like that. So I, 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 I there's too much, there's, we have two, we have an unbelievable company that I want to have be a, a draw for talent. Uh, we hire a thousand, we literally hire thousands of people in our technology area. And, uh, almost every year, hundreds every year, and I, and I want access to the talent that comes out of the University of Washington and the people working in Seattle. So that's my, my professional interest. So yeah. Nike's gonna open an engineering center in Seattle. Uh, I would be lying if we're not talking about that. Okay, yeah, because yeah. you know, we've been talking about Facebook and Google and Twitter, they all have offices here because they yep. want to access the talent. And yep. Based on what you just said, it sounds like Seattle's a prime spot for Nike to open up a yeah, shop. I think it is, and it, we're 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 more alike than different. You know, we just hired a brand new CIO, Jim Schofield from Coca Cola. He was the CTO at Coca Cola, and we have a brand new CTO. And when we say CTO, we mean consumer tech ops officer who runs the Nike Plus, who does the apps and the and the and the product side of it. Wolf Wolf is a Microsoft. My, he's MySpace Microsoft guy, has a home in Bellevue. He's highly motivated, he, he's pushing it. Jim knows that there's an unbelievable amount of talent in this, uh, in this area. And the school is, as we bore witness to some of the folks up here today, the school's producing unbelievable talent in this area. So if you're, if you're Nike, 
uh, you're, you have to be looking at what, what does an engineering office in, uh, in Seattle look like? And so we are. Okay, well you know Taylor's phone number whenever you make the decision. That's right. And we'll get the scoop on GeekWire. Uh -huh. Taylor has a great uh, sports newsletter, by the way, that we should mention. You should all subscribe to it if you're interested in this topic in any way. It's uh, the intersection of sports and technology. So this is a, a question that you don't ask many people on a technology panel, but tell us about your shoes. Those are, well, those, those are real nice. Do you know what the shoes can are, you, can, right? Can you, you want to stand up and show everybody your shoes? Well, they and and what they, size are you like? They 14? are called they are called sneakers. So oh it's no, not go, that go much, stand right that stand right over there. Stand right over there. Right there. You want to, I'm a size 15. Maybe put it maybe put them up here on the glass. You're really? a size 15. I'm a size 15. Oh my God! Now so no wonder are, you work at a shoe that company. That is the that is a that's a retro shoe. That's a Jordan shoe. Number yeah. the Jordan right. 11. The right. Jordan the Jordan 11 low done in the Georgetown Hoyas colors. So, so what's the what's the significance so, of that? Why why George why George? Uh, Georgetown's been a Jordan school for a long, long time. Uh, if, you, if you follow Georgetown, Coach John Thompson, big, big Coach John Thompson, who led him to the NCAAs many years, is on our board. And his son is the coach now, and we have an ongoing relationship with him. And so, the, and, and uh, you, you know, we put, we put uh, literally hundreds of thousands of SKUs into the marketplace every 90 days. And, and this shoe's been in the line on and off for the better part of 20 years. And so storytelling and materials and color are what keeps that shoe interesting for consumers and creates demand. And so this, yeah. the Georgetown uh, version of one of our most popular shoes, uh, I chose to wear. I start every day with what shoes do I want to wear, and then I dress my way up. Right. It's always <laughs> jeans. It's terrible. I meet, when I meet people, I ran footwear at Nike for seven years before I took apparel and equipment. I meet people from their feet up. It's a terrible habit. I, I choose whether or not I'm gonna like lay on the horn or get mad at somebody if they're being obnoxious after I glance at their feet. And, uh, and I start every day with the, I, it's jeans, jeans and a t-shirt most days at Nike for me, but I start with my shoes and then I, I work my way up. We should have worn Nike shoes today. I thought you were you gonna think? wear your I was Nike going shoes. To, I didn't you think? <laughs> so, so speaking of shoes, I know this, if I'm not mistaken, this is the Lunar Flyknit. It is. The Lunar Fly, Flyknit 3, I believe. That is, that is. So this, you've informed us, is your, your favorite Nike shoe. It is, I love this shoe. Why do you love it and what does this shoe say about innovation and the state of footwear at Nike? It's a great question. Um, I, I think a lot of, you know, we, uh, we, we consider ourselves to be one of the more innovative companies in the world. Whether you agree with that or not uh, is entirely up to you. Obviously, I would hope to prove you wrong with, with our stories and our, and our products. And that innovation for the, for the last 40 years or so has been primarily a design-based innovation. What is the product gonna look like? How is it gonna feel on your body? What's the, what's the engineering of the, of the pattern on the, on the clothing? What's, the, what's underneath your foot? Is it Nike Air? Is it shocks? Is it, is it now Lunar Foam? And this shoe represents the first time that we said, yes, that's great, but that's not good enough. We also want to be innovating in the manufacturing of the shoe, and that actually the methods of the make. Uh, and so shoes have been made the same way for decades, and, and we wanted to bust that paradigm. And this is, this is where uh, tech and digitization of our, of our process made a huge difference. This is, this is knitted, that's a knit upper uh, with some intellectual property. You can kind of see the yellow the yellow carbon fiber going through there to provide support on the shoe. It's effectively a sweater on your foot. It's knitted on an on a apparel knit machine, uh, adapted through some technology and some proprietary information to make it an upper. And it, there's almost zero waste. The amount of waste from this shoe can, can fit literally in a thimble. It's just leftover thread at the end of the day. You cut, the, you cut it off of the knit machine. The amount of waste of, a, of an Air Force One uh, or, or the shoe I have on my foot, which is made by stitching pieces together, cutting them out with, with dyes, uh, the waste that hits the, the factory floor, this eliminates all of that. And, and now we're talking about a really powerful innovation, which is the design innovation, making a beautiful object of desire and innovating in a new way of manufacturing, which is shorter lead time. It can be done anywhere you have a knit machine. You don't have to do it, it where, where you have access to to moderately skilled labor, and uh, and you can get it to market right away, and you can personalize it because instead of having a tech pack, if we were the, if we were the the product team at Nike making a shoe, you'd be the designer, I'd be the product marketing person, you'd be the engineer, the developer. We we would send some drawings and some material swatches and stuff to Asia, and say, please make me a shoe, and it would come back 
we would draw on it, we'd send it over. This is a file we send on the computer. This is, this is the file. We send the file and we send it to the NIT machine. The, NIT, the, the operator wow. of the NIT machine can operate many NIT machines, hits it into the NIT machine, out comes a shoe. Wow. You, your left foot is weird and uh, oddly shapen, different than your right foot, well, I'll adjust the file. You know, we were talking about the Glowforge earlier, but gosh, there's a lot of oh, yeah. uh, parallels there. Yep, I there mean, is. Could there be a day when Nike provides a file to the consumer who then prints their shoes at their house? Yes, there could be a day where that happens. <laughs> how, how, how far away is that? You know, uh, next next month. You know, you if you it? if you take, you know, we we have a huge initiative in our company called Manufacturing Revolution. It's really just innovation in manufacturing. Uh, if you look at uh, 3D printing, you look at knitting, you look at automation, you look at robotics, you look at all, what what's been a huge unlock for us is the. Um, motion sensing and the, and the camera, that, the, because a lot of times you have, to, you have to register a part before you can do something with it. Yeah. All, all that's now, you can automate all that and, and could, do I envision a future where we might still own the file from an IP perspective? Because we want to, it's a Nike product. You can't just have anybody make a Nike product. And you can manufacture that either in your home or we will do it for you at our store. Well, yeah, that's not that far away. So you talked earlier, as, as we're on the subject of shoe technology, obviously about the Nike Plus and, and the sensor in the shoe that communicates with the phone. And, and, but it seems like there's so much more potential in shoes to just embed tons and tons of sensors. Oh, yeah. And to change things. For so sure. where, where is that headed? I think, you know, I, I, it won't be that many more years where all, all of our footwear will be connected. We'll, we'll, we'll know where they're at. Uh, Will it have uh, an IP address to that extent? I mean, is, is that, it, is that it, where you're headed? It, it may not have its own IP address. It will certainly have its own serialization, uh, which helps with counterfeiting. It helps with uh, parallel trade. It helps with a lot of, if you're the COO, a lot of the other stuff you care about besides, besides some, of the, some of the more sexy stuff. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I th you know, I, would we like to know um, how your shoes are wearing on your feet? Yeah, we would like to know that. We oh. think we can help you run better. We think we can be... Uh, be a catalyst for you to do something different. Would we like to use that to, to uh, engage you more in the selling of our product? Yes, we would like to do that. We would like to tie you together in communities. Yes, we would like to do that. That, 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 that. That's all part of the future. Not just footwear, your apparel as well. It's a little trickier, frankly, in apparel. It's on your body. There's lots of people trying to work right now on, on, on how you get that into apparel. It's easier on your foot because underneath your foot is typically some type of chassis that is foam or air or, or gel in the case of some of the competition, there, there's more real estate there for sensors. And not to mention the fact that you're wearing your shoes generally every day or you know, you're wearing them more consistently. I hope you're wearing clothes every day <laughs> well, also. But you're not wearing the same piece of clothing in the same way that you're wearing you know, your shoes. And True. not everyone picks from their thousands of shoes in their closet every morning. Eric. True, not, it's not thousands, <laughs> not thousands, yeah. But yeah, I think that's a, that's a fairly easy uh, future to, uh, to imagine. Yeah. yeah, without Good. a doubt. Yeah, so it's Blue Friday. It is here, Blue Friday here in Seattle. I see some. I saw some jerseys. I saw some Nike yeah. jerseys out there. There was, there was a couple plat. There was a couple platinum jerseys over there. Nice, nice. Yes. And yeah. you're yeah, you're a season that. ticket holder, aren't you? I am a season ticket holder. You got a suite? Yeah. Is that right? Or a Nike suite down there somewhere? It's something like that. Don't give everything <laughs> away. Come on. We've been we've been doing our research. I get to <laughs> sit. I get to sit in one of those end zone suites. That's got to be the best seat in the house. I love. How do you not be a fan? And, and you know, and, uh, we got that when we signed the NFL deal. So when the, with the NFL deal, at the time when I was in charge of product, came some uh, access and uh, relationship with the football team here in the community. That's awesome. Yeah. Let's talk about this guy right here. Uh, we had a VIP dinner yesterday with a bunch of CEOs and you were there and the question was around the table, name a person that, when, the, when you say the word transformative, who do you think of? And, and you brought the only sports reference, which I appreciated. Uh, yeah, Pete, Pete Carroll. Why? Why Pete? It was. By, <laughs> by the way, that was a that was a pretty that was a good dinner. I mean, people were coming up with. I, there were a couple of names I had never even heard of. They were clearly Seattle-based tech pioneers were being listed as transformative. That's when I kind of felt like the Portland guy at the table, right? <laughs> and I give it the old. And I was first. I give it the old Pete Carroll. <laughs> uh, but I think, I really do think, I think he's trans, I, I think of it in a couple different dimensions. He had to transform himself. If you remember, I, I also am a huge fan of the New England Patriots, which made Ooh. last year's Super Bowl somewhat, somewhat of a conflict in my house. I know. 
Uh, I, I mean, life, I, I grew up in Montana. We, you don't root for teams, you root for individuals, and then you root for the teams that those individuals are on. And so, uh, uh, I, I think, you remember, he was the coach of the New England Patriots, right? And, and he was terrible, frankly. It was unsuccessful. And so I, th I think he, and coming out of the USC deal, I think he's had, to, he's had to transform himself. But he also kept enough of himself. He, he, he kept enough of what makes him great and gives him energy and brought that to the NFL, learned from the mistakes of the past, and, and kind of transform what you think of as an NFL coach. I'd like to see him chew his gum a little less hard, frankly. <laughs> but the you know, he's kind of college coaching the NFL game and doing a heck of a job. And it seems to resonate with the players. And I think he's, you know, you don't have to be Bill Belichick or Tom Coughlin to be successful. I think he's done a really, really nice job of transforming the profile of a coach for athletes who are making way more money than he is, who have way more, uh, way more ego than he does. And, he's been, and you can't argue with, with the success that he's had. And it's not an easy job. And speaking of coaching, I know you were a coach for your children growing up playing was. sports over two decades, I think. Yeah. What did you, did you learn anything from that? And did you take anything from that back to your day job at Nike in terms of managing and coaching and helping people grow as a team? Yeah, you know, I, I, um, uh, the job comes, you, gotta make, you have to make some compromises when you do a, a job like I, I have, uh, as I'm sure everybody in the audience does. But I love coaching my kids' teams. So I coached almost literally every single one of them. I lived in the Netherlands for five years uh, and coached honk ball in the Netherlands for five years. They didn't let me coach football, i.e. soccer, because I, I didn't know enough about it to be a European football coach. Uh, but I coached honk ball, which is baseball. And uh, that's how I learned to speak Dutch. Uh, and, and I loved it. It's what gave me, it's what, it's what put stuff back in the tank. Because I'm a big believer as a leader, you've got a huge part of your job as a leader is to give energy to those that you work with and, and who work with you. And that was the way I always put, put fuel back into the tank. And it taught me a ton about how to relate to people, uh, b both in the Netherlands, where the, where the language was obviously a little bit of, a, of an issue. And, and this notion that you're not, you're really, we're at Nike, we, we don't tell you that you're gonna be the boss of a group. We tell you you're gonna be the manager of a, of a team or the coach of a team. And your job is to get everything out of every member of that team. And for sure, you're gonna have people on the team that are, that are gonna be more promotable or have higher potential. But you have, but everybody on the team is important. And, and that's, that, that's a good sports analogy. And, that, and I learned that as a coach. When you're, when you're the coach of, five-year-olds and you know parents want to know why their kids aren't playing and the kids what, what, kids are crying because one kid's playing more than the other and you have to sit down and you have to kind of talk to kids in a, in a really simple language about what's the role you're why you're important on the team even if you're not getting to start that's all that all translates to being a good leader at work I think so, so I love it I, I miss it apparently when your kids go to school, High school and college, they don't let the parents coach so much. So <laughs> I gotta, I gotta, I've got to fill that in somewhere. Yeah. So when you spoke to those Foster School of Business students a couple of years ago, it was striking one of the things that you talked about uh, in the area of work-life balance, which has been a consistent theme throughout this conference, starting with the Amazon panel and then coming up uh, through, through many other sessions. You had a very strong message on the topic of work-life balance as it related to leadership yeah. and the importance of work-life balance, not only for employees, but for leaders. And it was, it was very specific and instructive. I wonder if you could share that with the audience yeah. here today. Uh, okay, that's fair. Um, I, I'm all, first of all, I'm a huge believer that there's a big difference between leadership and management. And you can be a great manager and suck at leadership, and you can be a pretty crappy manager and be an unbelievable leader. And, and management I describe as, you know, uh, is your door open? Do you give timely feedback? Are you evaluating your people fairly? Uh, is there equity in the group? Do they have the tools that they need to do their job? Do they, do they have direction, et cetera? We, you, you all know you've worked for good managers, you've worked for bad managers. And then the role of a leader is a little bit different. The role of a leader I always describe as you have to create an environment where everybody who comes to work in your team or in your company, if you're the CEO, that's your job, has to believe that they can do their best work when they get, when they're a member of your team. Irrespective, at Nike we say all the time, irrespective of race, religion, sexual orientation, size, handicap, ethnicity, we want you to believe when you come to work, you can do your best work. And the leader of the group's job is to provide an environment where, you, where that is true and you believe it. And to do that takes an incredible amount of, of energy and compassion. And if you're a leader, 
you have got to you have got to find some balance in your life so that you can provide that to the organization because i'm a firm believer that the better i'll, I'll use the male part of the gender the better father son brother uncle friend you think you are the better employee for nike you're going to be so i want this right or else i'm not getting the best nike employee so get right here and if you, can, if you see me as the COO walking out the door to go coach my kids' teams, you should say to yourself, geez, if Sprunk can do it, I, I, I gotta find a way to do it. Yeah, I want you to find a way to do it. If that's how you get energy, do that. If, if, it's, a, if it's a hobby, find time for the hobby. If it's traveling, find time to travel. Because I want the best you we can have at Nike. And then we'll provide you an environment where you can do your best work, but you gotta get right before you come there. And so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big believer in balance. That's why I coach the kids' teams. I'm a big work hard, play hard. That's why I always come up to the Seahawks games. That's all play right there. But I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. And I think that's part of our culture as a company. Yeah. Well, it's a great note to conclude on. And I, yeah, Thank absolutely. You. I want to give a big thank you to Eric Sprunk, the CEO of Nike, for spending time with us and spending the day with us as well. It's been you great bet. to get I, to know I, you. I really enjoyed the day. Really, I learned. I learned a lot. I, I saw some companies that uh, that we do business with. Had a chance to talk to them. It was nice to Concur folks were on stage earlier. We just signed a deal with Concur. I was happy to happy to see them. And 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 I saw lots of good ideas. And John, yeah, and what, John was a overtly uh, stating that uh, w they, there should be some Nike product there, so. Yeah, well, what about Vices? Would, would you see a potential there in that? So, so we, know that, we know that company pretty well. Um, when I ran product, I had a pretty hard and fast rule. Anything above the neck was not a place for, we, uh, for us to play. Too big, too risky. Now, we're great at providing data. We're great at, at, at providing insight, you, at working with the athletes that we work with. But for our company to get into that business, that, I'm not sure that meets the, yeah. the, the, you don't sell that many football helmets, <laughs> to be honest. And the, and the risk of that, um, yeah. and, and frankly, we're not, we're not helmet designers. And so do we think, I, I love that space. I, I think there's a time, I think technology is gonna transform. It, it, will tra it is transforming our company. It transforms the way we get insights from athletes. It transforms the way we move things through the supply chain. It transforms the way we design our product, the, the flying it being one example of that. It, it literally transforms everything. It transforms the way we, we, we share services and experiences with our consumer. It's not just buy this product. You know, we have hundreds, we have literally hundreds of millions of, of connections with consumers every day. They visit our stores, they go to our social media sites, they buy our apps, they, uh, they run in 5Ks or half marathons that we sponsor. We have tons of connectivity with our, our consumers. There, there will be, a, there's gonna be a day where, uh, where technology will transform all of that and accelerate that. And so, so some, of those, some of those ideas we saw today, but those are, that's right in that wheelhouse. We, we, we will know more about an athlete. You'll know more watching the Seattle Seahawks play a game three or four or five years from now than you do today by a factor of 100. You, you might know uh, how much intensity Richard Sherman has exerted at halftime of the game. You might know how long he's run. You might know uh, what, what, the, what the impact rating was on the big hit he gave uh, Gronkowski going to the end zone. You, and and we, want, we want to know all that because it, it leads to better products for those athletes. I think, I think we will all know that. I'll, you know, I'll know how tired you are when you're running a 5K next to me. Because I'll, I'll, I'll see it on your wristband. It'll say, out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, Taylor, we just started. <laughs> Judging. Well, Eric Sprunk, thank you very much for being here. It's been fantastic. My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Tom. That's awesome. Really good. Thanks, Taylor.